Morning, everybody. This training is on how to perform an effectiveness check. A lot of clients that I see and companies that I audit, when I look at their uh, CAPA system, I see a lot of CAPAs that they've implemented, but they didn't fix the problem because it reoccurred. And the best way to make sure that you won't have that happen to you is to learn how to perform effectiveness checks well. Because once you know how to do an effectiveness check well, it will teach you, oh, this CAPA probably isn't going to cut it because I'm not going to pass the effectiveness check. It's really showing you what, what you're going to have to do to make sure you pass the test when it comes to looking at your CAPA. And so I actually, when I write a CAPA for somebody, I actually write the CAPA after I thought about what the effectiveness check is going to be. So I think this is probably the most important part of a CAPA process except for maybe root cause analysis, which is the beginning of the process where you try to figure out what caused this. So this is one of two cheap, um, short trainings that I've done. Uh, they're actually free, so you can download these from uh, the website. One is for root cause analysis. There are five tools for conducting a root cause analysis, and this one's how to perform an effectiveness check. One's being released in September, the other one's being released in October. But you, if you want to capture both, plus some other material on your CAPA process, and get my CAPA toolkit, all you have to do is go on the website and purchase the CAPA webinar. At the bottom of this slide, I have a link. It's for CAPA effectiveness checks. That's to an article that I wrote on how to do CAPA effectiveness checks. Going on to the next slide here. We're attempting to. There we go. So here are the requirements in the regulations for CAPA effectiveness checks. This is all of them. So if you look in 21 CFR 82100, which is the subsection of the QSR that is specific to corrective and preventive action, the sub subsection A4 says verifying or validating the corrective and preventive actions to ensure that such action is effective and does not adversely affect the finished device. That's where it says to verify. I'm not going to read these other ones here because they're almost identical wording. They certainly have the exact same intent, but the first two are for ISO 1345 for corrective and preventive actions, and then for 9001 corrective and preventive action again. So in all three regulations, you have the requirement for performing an effectiveness check. The wording that you will typically see in a 43 finding from the FDA inspectors if you don't do an effectiveness check properly, is procedures for corrective and preventive action have not been adequately established. They always say that the procedures are not correctly established, but then they give you examples of what the problem is because there's so many things that could be wrong with your procedure. And usually the issue um, with effectiveness checks shows up with this wording where it says there are numerous instances where your CAPAs were not verified adequately. So you might have just verified that you changed the procedure but you didn't go out there and make sure the problem didn't reoccur. Why are you going to do an effectiveness check in the future? In order to, pre to ensure that the corrective actions will prevent future occurrences. Um, you don't want to um, implement a corrective action and then have it not actually prevent something. That's why you have to do an effectiveness check. And when should you do it? Well, if you do it immediately after you've implemented it, Anybody can cram the night before an exam and pass the exam. But if you ask the person 30 days later, they're probably going to forget. So that's a much better time is to wait a little while until they've had an opportunity to forget and slip back into their old habits to see if the new habit that you tried to train them on actually stuck or not. These are three methods I don't recommend, but I see all the time written in corrective action plans for how they did an effectiveness check. Number one, here's a copy of the procedure, or a copy of the DCO, or ECO, or ECN, saying we approve this new and revised procedure. Oh, we even attached the red line. Oh, we even attached the training records. But if nobody follows the procedure and nobody remembers any of the training that they received, it wasn't effective. The other one that I see a lot is, and I see this a lot for contract manufacturers, is they say, we're going to look to make sure it doesn't happen in the next three orders. 
Well, if you only order something once every six months, you're going to keep it open for 18 months before you find out whether it was effective or not. That's probably not going to be a practical solution either. So, how might you do an effectiveness check? Well, one method I've seen people suggest is a supervisor evaluation. I cross that off. I do not recommend that one either. Supervisor evaluations are not systematic audits of something. They're not objective. They're very subjective. And if the supervisor really knew how to prevent this in the first place, the supervisor wouldn't have gotten a, uh, had to write a cap in the first place. So I don't like to leave these up to the really limited to one employee that would be appropriate, but then it probably didn't deserve a cap in the first place. It probably needed correction. So if it's worthy of a CAPA, supervisor evaluation is probably not good enough. Now, one of the methods that the FDA likes to see a lot, and they see this whenever you have an internal audit finding, is a re-audit. So, you know, you had a you had a nonconformity or you had a 43 and we implement a CAPA, we'll go back and audit it. And we call that a re-audit. And you might just audit that one little area, so it might be a very short audit. But if it happens at a supplier and you implement a supplier corrective action and the supplier is in another state or another country, maybe you don't want to go audit them on site. So you could do a desktop audit. That's another option. If it's at another facility, it's also possible to do a desktop audit. In fact, a lot of auditors, so let's say it's a notified body auditor or an FDA inspector, a lot of times they never actually go out and look at the equipment a lot of times they sit in the conference room, and if you can do it in a conference room, it could be done as a desktop audit anywhere. It doesn't have to be done on site if it can be done in a conference room. The next possible method you could use is verification and validation reports. So this would be, for instance, if the problem was sterilization and you were having a product that wasn't sterile or something like that, uh, producing a revalidation report for the sterilization process would be a suitable effectiveness check. The reason why validation reports are great effectiveness checks is because they have right built into the protocol an acceptance criteria. One of the key things that makes an effectiveness check valid or not is if it had an acceptance criteria. If you didn't have any prospective plan for what was going to be good enough for the effectiveness check, it's not an effectiveness check. You're just doing a spot check to see what's going on. But if, if you really want to make sure something worked, set a threshold quantitatively for what's going to meet the requirements. That's sort of what a validation is. It's a prospective protocol with acceptance criteria built into it right up front, and it says how you're going to evaluate the process. Now, if it's not a production process that you can validate, that's not really an option for you. But if it is, that's a great way to document your effectiveness checks. And you don't have to do anything further. Once you've gotten a, a validation report, you could reference that validation report, say it met the acceptance criteria, and you are done. No need to do another audit on top of that. Um, another option is a quiz. So a lot of times the issue is inadequate procedures, inadequate training, inadequate understanding what regulatory requirements are, so that's a very common scenario for complaint handling and MDR reporting. So you might have a training where you revise the procedure, you make the procedures more clear, you make it very clear what the acceptance criteria are for whether this is a MDR or not, you give specific examples for the type of product it is, and then you give people a quiz on it and see if they pass the quiz. And don't make it an easy quiz, but do make it something that's very objective. True, false, fill in the blank, multiple choice. Don't give essay questions because that's going to just ask for trouble and more work for you. The best method of all, though, for all the types of effectiveness checks is something that has a metric, something that's measurable. That's why I like validation reports because they always have some data and some data analysis there. But anytime you have a quality objective or a metric that we can measure and graph, if I can show it with a graph, I can be convinced it's effective. If you have to use statistics to show me the difference from before and after, it wasn't very effective. It should be obvious just looking at the graph, oh, something happened here, a miracle, call the kappa. Now, if you're going to set quality objectives, the clause in the 
uh, ISO standard is clause 5.4.1. The best uh, sort of rules of thumb for how to set a good quality objective are to make sure all of the above or all the items here that I bulleted are listed in for the quality objective. Who's going to measure the quality objective? What will be measured specifically? Where will it be measured? How, when will it be measured? What kind of frequency? Uh, how? What tools are you going to use? Uh, is it going to be an automated report you run from a system or is it something you have to go out and visually observe? Um, how are you going to analyze it? Are you going to do a graph? Are you going to do a t-test? Are you going to do a run chart? Is it a log plot or a linear plot? What is it? And then who who will the data analysis be communicated to? Are you communicating it to the whole entire organization, the department, the management team? Who? So if it just stays in a, in a folder somewhere at your desk, that's not really meeting the requirements of a quality objective. They have to be communicated to the rest of the company. Here's an example of a graph of effectiveness. So we have a process where it's right on the bitter edge of sometimes almost not passing the upper specification. It kind of looks like it might be in control, but not within the specifications for upper and lower control limit. So we're going to make an adjustment to the tooling or the process, and voila, after the CAPA is implemented, we have now a process that's in control at a lower uh, level of measurement, and it's much it's much closer to the middle point between the upper and lower specification. It's still not perfect, but sometimes if, let's say you're modifying a molding tool, you can't hit it perfect every time. And if you're going to have to remake a tool, sometimes they do things steel safe, so they'd rather be a little bit closer to one side versus the other so they can polish away a little bit of material to get closer to the middle by being steel safe. So this would be a typical graph that I might see for a dimension on a molded part after they remade the mold as a corrective action to try to have it be the process be more capable and have parts inspect more often. And so this is a, a good example. And you don't need any kind of statistics to, to determine that there is definitely a difference between the mean before and after. This next slide, slide nine, these, these are all the key elements of a CAPA form. And at the bottom of this slide, I show you a link to an article I wrote on how to create an effective CAPA form. And on the right-hand side, I reference Form 009. That's a uh, template that I created for a CAPA. So if you order my full CAPA course, um, that webinar, you get the slide deck, you get the recording, you get the CAPA form, you get the CAPA procedure as well as another work instruction that tells you how to analyze risks for a CAPA to use a risk-based approach. But when you're using my form and you're documenting the CAPA, the verification of effectiveness, there are two parts to it. There's the plan for verification of effectiveness, and I said this is one of the most important things. I try to do that first before I've done anything else so I know if my plan is good enough. And then after you actually complete the effectiveness check, you document it in the second section, the effectiveness verification section. And then there's a signature and date at the end. If you want to make sure that you do a thorough effectiveness check, so let's say I'm going back and re-auditing a process, you need to go back and expand your search to look at other records, just like the person would have done when they were doing the root cause analysis before they implemented the CAPA. You're doing this after they implemented the CAPA, and you're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to look at other records. You're going to look at other product lines, other equipment, other people. So let's say you have uh, one production line that's making uh, a certain type of knee implant, and you implement the corrective action there. Your process, your, your CAPA is not going to be effective if they just walk over to another product line where you're making a different type of knee implant, and you didn't implement the same corrective actions over there even though you have the same process in both places. Wherever that process is the same, you're going to have to implement the corrective actions in both places. So you need to make sure that, that you're looking beyond that when you're doing your root cause analysis. Be as a good effectiveness check is going to look beyond where the problem occurred as well. Another tool that I use for effectiveness checks, particularly when it's in response to a 483, 
if you know the FDA is going to be coming back in the next 12 months, which they're required to do if there's official action indicated and there's going to be a warning letter involved, um, you need to make sure that your corrective action plan is really solid and it was effective. So if you're even a little bit in doubt, one of the approaches I like to do is I'd like to bring in an ex-FDA inspector. So I'll bring in Leo. He, he's one of the consultants that I use. He just retired from the agency in January of this year. And he'll come into a client and he'll do an effectiveness check just like he was doing a level three inspection for the agency in response to a warning letter. So he'll do the same type of effectiveness check that he would do. He'd look at the same regulations. He'd approach it the same exact way. And that gets you prepared for, oh, this is how they're going to go look at it. I hadn't thought of it looking at it that way. Oh, there's a whole bunch more things that we need to do. He'll help you see that even after you think you're done. And it's important to make sure you do this type of mock FDA inspection sufficiently early before you're expecting the FDA to come back so that if you find something that you haven't, you still have time to do something about it. If you expect them to come back in January, don't have it the last week of December. Have it in November or even earlier because you need time to make sure that you can address any residual issues that remain after the corrective action was implemented that he finds. And if you're interested in seeing more about his recommendations, uh, he recorded something uh, on FDA recalls where we talk a little bit about that as well. And uh, we also have a webinar up here on FDA inspections uh, that's free. So if you're interested in uh, preparing for FDA inspections, I recommend registering for that and downloading it. If you need help responding to your 43s and you're in the middle of an audit or an inspection and it's not going well, give us a call and I can help you out. If you can't reach me, uh, please uh, give Glenn Melvin a call and I hope to hear from you soon. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.